Stanford University. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, my name is Pam Matson. I'm the Dean of the School of Earth Sciences at Stanford, and I am very uh, pleased to welcome you here tonight to see so many of you here um, for our, our two evening series on the Great Tohoku Disaster. On March 11th, Japan experienced a magnitude 9 earthquake, the strongest in recent history. It was followed almost immediately by a major tsunami and then by a series of emergencies related to nuclear energy plants. And for many of us, this cascade of disasters is, uh, is past tense. It's a thing of the past. But for millions of Japanese, it's not over, and it's uh, not going to be over for quite some time. In the following two nights, we'll explore what happened then, what's still happening now, and the implications for for Japan as well as other parts of the world, including California, and we'll talk about lessons learned. I'd like to start the evening by briefly introducing the speakers, both for tonight and for tomorrow night, so you know um, what they're going to be talking about. And then I'll, we'll uh, briefly talk about the plan for the evening, and then we'll get going. Tonight's first speaker is Professor Greg Barroza. Uh, Greg is the chair of the Department of Geophysics here and the associate director of the Southern California Earthquake Center. Greg's an earthquake, earthquake seismologist and he's worked uh, in Japan as well as California and other parts of the world. His presentation tonight will cover what happened in the earthquake and in the tsunami that was generated by it, why an earthquake of this size was not anticipated, and what it means for earthquake uh, hazards in Japan and, and elsewhere. Our second speaker tonight is Professor Greg Deerline, the director of the Bloom Earthquake Engineering Center at Stanford and a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Greg uh, also has worked in Japan as well as around the world, and he will describe the effect of the earthquake ground shaking and tsunami inundation on infrastructures, on buildings and transportation systems and ports and so forth, and he'll talk about the human casualties and devastation um, associated with that. And then tonight's final speaker is Dr. Catherine Marvel. Uh, Kate is a fellow at the Center for, for Inter, uh, International Security and Cooperation in the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. Um, she studies security issues related to climate change and to energy. And her presentation tonight will address some of the frequently asked questions about the nuclear disaster in Japan. What happened? How does it compare to previous accidents, such as uh, Three Mile Island and Chernobyl? And what does this mean for the future of uh, nuclear energy? Then tomorrow night, we'll have three more speakers. Uh, this will be moderated by Dan Schneider from Freeman Spogli Institute. Uh, the first will be Ross Stein from the USGS and again focusing on earthquakes and aftershocks and, and, uh, um, and what that means for Japan and other places. Then Lori Johnson, who is the founder of Lori Johnson Consulting, will talk about response and recovery in the impacted region. And she'll also talk about the early organizing for the longer term recovery in that country and lessons and, and insights that we can take home to California. And uh, finally, Masa Aoki, a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, will give a brief summary of the economic consequences and prospects of the disaster for Japan's GDP, global supply chains, international currency cooperation, and other such things. And he'll talk to about the um, societal successes and failures of, uh, related to disaster preparedness in Japan. So as you can see, um, an amazing set of talks, both tonight and tomorrow night. I'm looking forward to them all. Um, I, I hope you can come tomorrow night to hear the second half. But to, let's start with tonight's talks. Um, our plan is for each of our speakers, the three speakers tonight, to give about a 20-minute talk each. And then uh, after they're all done speaking, we'll ask them to come up here, and we'll have a 30-minute or so question and answer panel discussion with all three panelists. So let's get started. We'll start with Greg Barroza, and then Greg Deerline, and then Kate Marvel. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Pam, and thank all of you for being here. 
Uh, as Pam said, I'm going to be talking about earth science aspects of the earthquake, so I'm going to focus on what the earth did, uh, how, the, how the ground shook, how the ground deformed, how that set up the tsunami, why an earthquake and tsunami of that size was not anticipated, and what it uh, might mean for earthquake hazards in Japan and elsewhere. So I'll uh, start my talk by uh, talking about a magnitude 7.2 earthquake that happened a little after noon on March 9th. This earthquake uh, occurred off the Miyagi uh, coast of Japan. It's shown here with the yellow star. Uh, the, the earthquake accommodated relative motion between the Pacific plate and the Eurasian plate. That is, the Pacific plate is converging towards northeast Japan at a rate of about 83 millimeters per year, a little over three inches per year uh, at this locale. And that uh, parts of the plate boundary are stuck. And when the stress builds sufficiently to overcome the friction that sticks the plates together, uh, we get an earthquake. So this earthquake at magnitude 7.2 was large enough to be strongly felt uh, on the mainland, despite the fact that it occurred well offshore. It was large enough to, uh, to trigger a tsunami warning. It was large enough to trigger a tsunami a few tens of centimeters high. So there was a, a tsunami alert uh, for it. But the tsunami from this earthquake uh, did not uh, lead to any damage. Now, we know in retrospect that this was the start of a foreshock sequence. Uh, that is, this earthquake occurred on March 9th, a little after noon. About 50 hours later, in the afternoon of March 11th, uh, was when the big one occurred. So that the orange dots up there are the aftershocks of this foreshock. So they are themselves uh, uh, categorized as foreshocks uh, to the subsequent March 11th earthquake. This earthquake, as you know, was magnitude 9. There are various ways of uh, quantifying earthquakes. The magnitude scale is uh, logarithmic, and in that sense, it compresses the differences between pretty large and very large earthquakes. Uh, magnitude 7 earthquake is, is big. Uh, an earthquake of that size happens about once per month on average somewhere on Earth. Uh, magnitude 9s are, are completely, different, uh, completely different beasts in terms of the size and their, their global uh, impact. Uh, many, many times, as we'll see, larger than a uh, magnitude 7.2. Uh, the orange uh, dots here are aftershocks of the uh, magnitude uh, 9 earthquake. And you can see they, they spread along uh, the coast for something like 400 kilometers and uh, from the coast out towards the trench where the two plates meet offshore <coughs> for uh, between 100 and, and 200 kilometers. So a tremendous uh, area of the fault ruptured in this earthquake. Now, unless you were in an airplane, you experienced this earthquake. What's shown here is the uh, global wave field. The, so each one of these uh, wiggles represents a seismogram. They're arranged in distance, increasing uh, from uh, zero, which is where the earthquake was, to the antipode, the opposite side of the Earth, uh, up here. And uh, time increases from left to right. So these big wiggles that you see, those are the Rayleigh waves. These are large surface waves that propagate out from the earthquake. Uh, they, uh, they, they, they propagate out. They go around the Earth the long way. They do multiple orbits around the Earth. Uh, the, the amplitude scale is shown down here in the lower right. That's one centimeter. So in uh, California, we moved a couple of centimeters, about an inch uh, in, this, in this earthquake. So it's a re this is a really big uh, earthquake. And to demonstrate that, it had a magnitude 7.9 uh, aftershock. This is probably the most obscure 7.9 earthquake <laughs> ever. Uh, you can see it's really uh, buried in, 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 the, in the waves of this other earthquake. And I'm embarrassed to admit, I didn't even know this uh, aftershock had happened until uh, days later. So when a big earthquake like this happens, there's, a, there's an opportunity to, uh, if we have our act together, to respond quite quickly to it, to issue uh, what's called earthquake early warning. This is a a system that's based on measurements of the, the, the fastest traveling, the weak seismic waves, the P waves, uh, to indicate that an earthquake is underway and that it, it might be big, big enough to be concerned about, uh, and, and give a warning before the strong shaking begins. Uh, and, and that, uh, that, that uh, uh, earthquake early warning was, was realized quite well in this earthquake. Uh, there's also a tsunami warning, and that, and that too, uh, functioned uh, quite well in this earthquake. Here's a chronology, or a timeline, if you like, of the uh, response to the earthquake. So the earthquake happened. The fault was rupturing for uh, about two and a half minutes. Uh, 
So the earthquake started and the, and the slip on the fault spread over the fault for, um, for uh, about 160 seconds, throwing off uh, seismic waves all, all the way. The JMA, uh, Japan Meteorological Agency, estimated initially the magnitude of the earthquake to be 6.8. This is based on uh, the initial waves. That's large enough to, to generate a, an earthquake uh, uh, a shaking warning. Uh, the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center, PTWC, estimated the magnitude at 7.3 within five minutes. Within 10 minutes, both agencies uh, knew the earthquake was at, at least big enough to be uh, very dangerous. A magnitude 7.9 earthquake, often as not, that's the largest earthquake anywhere on Earth uh, during an average year. Uh, so that's, that's a big earthquake capable of a, of a large uh, tsunami, so both agencies uh, issued tsunami warnings, and the tsunami waves, as fast as they go, had not yet reached, uh, had not reached land. At least the, the, the crest of the waves had not reached uh, land. So, so that was issued well before the tsunami hit. And within 20 minutes, the U.S. Geological Survey at their headquarters, or their uh, National Earthquake Information Center, which does global earthquake monitoring, they had figured out that this was really an extreme, uh, extraordinary event. They had a magnitude of 8.8, .8, and as you know, it's now officially at 9, although there's some, still some range in those estimates. So uh, this is a slip model generated uh, for this earthquake. It's shown in movie form in the left, showing how the, the slip spreads across the fault as a function of time. This is the sort of thing that we can uh, reconstruct from seismic waves. What's shown on the right uh, these, these are in map view. What's shown on the right are snapshots of those, those seismic waves 10 seconds into the earthquake, 40 seconds into the earthquake. At, that's the middle panel on the top. At that point, the, the most of the slip, uh, or slip rate, it's a slip velocity that's contoured in these plots, is near the coast. And this was generating strong seismic waves uh, and, and strong shaking uh, on that, that part of the Japan coast. But the really uh, dangerous part of the earthquake was actually uh, shown in the third and fourth panels. That's when the slip rate gets high near the trench. Uh, the, the plate interface is deep near the coast. It comes to the surface at the trench. So when you get a lot of slip close to the trench axis, far from the coast, you, it, it deforms the seafloor uh, dramatically, and that's what uh, sets up the large tsunami. So this is uh, our model for the earthquake. What's shown uh, on the left now that I, I got rid of the animation is the cumulative slip. So something like uh, 30 meters of peak slip, large areas where there's 20 meters of, of that's relative motion within a few tens of seconds uh, across the fault. That's the sort of thing that happens in an earthquake of this size. And uh, just comparing this uh, slip model on the left with other slip models that arrive, that are derived using uh, similar data but with different approaches, uh, show generally the same thing, a, a bit of slip, uh, and actually by most measures a lot of slip near the shore, and then a, a just huge massive amounts of slip uh, in the UC Santa Barbara model, which is on the left, something like 60 meters or twice the amount of slip that we had near the trench axis. This is a movie of GPS uh, measurements uh, from Japan. Uh, the, the, uh, it's uh, animated by um, I'm going to stop it because I, I can't speak fast enough to keep up with it. Uh, it's animated by a group at the University of Alaska using data from Japan as uh, processed by people at, at JPL. So there are a lot of people involved with this. But what it's going to show is as the slip occurs offshore, how the island of Japan where these GPS instruments are located, how it deforms. It will show that on the left horizontally with arrows. And those arrows will change with time as the waves propagate through. It'll show it on the right with arrows that, that point up and down. That will show the vertical deformation of the ground as a function of time. And there will be a re residual uh, offset as well. So let me restart the movie. Actually, let me, let me really restart it. OK, so uh, not much is happening now. There's some uncertainty in GPS, as you know, if you've driven around uh, with your car. Um, but, but very, so here we're seeing on the left the uh, rapid accumulation of uh, displacement. You can see waves uh, propagating through the, the GPS dis measured displacement field. And you can see that these large arrows near the coast indicating that those parts of Japan had moved to the east, they aren't going back. 
So the fault has slipped. It, it slips in one direction. It doesn't go back. And so the Earth is left in a different configuration after the earthquake. Here we see an aftershock. And the, that's the magnitude 7.9 uh, down closer to Tokyo. So a couple of things to notice about this. One is that, the, well, first of all, the, the, the deformation doesn't reverse itself. It's permanent or static. The vectors are large, five and a half meters or so is the largest horizontally. They're particularly large when you consider that the, the slip is not happening underneath them. They, the slip is happening offshore, and, and the uh, elasticity of the Earth is sort of dragging Japan uh, with it. The other thing to notice is that the vertical arrows all point down. So what that means is that the, the, the land mass of Japan, the, the, the coast, eastern coast of north, northern Honshu, uh, dropped during the earthquake. Now the part offshore dropped even more, immediately offshore dropped even more, so the initial sense of the tsunami was a withdrawal. But off near the trench, as we'll see, there was a tremendous lifting of the seafloor, and uh, together with the fact that the, the coast is slightly lower, and this big dome of water that, uh, that, that generated the tsunami, it led to the, uh, the disaster that, that followed. Here, here's a, a map of the permanent displacements uh, from uh, GPS, from, the, from GSI in Japan, and it, it shows basically the same, uh, same story. So that, the, the research group in Japan at, at GSI um, solved, as we did, for the uh, distribution of slip required to fit all of that data, and that's shown on the left, you can see they too find tens of meters of slip uh, offshore. It's shown in color and, and uh, contoured. This is all based on measurements that were taken on land, so it's, it's a form of remote sensing. Um, and what's shown on the right is what's uh, most important for the tsunami. That's the, the vertical displacement of the seafloor. So you can see along the coast, the contours are blue. That's a drop of up to uh, something like two meters locally. And offshore, near the high slip region where the, the fault is getting shallower, there's five and a half meters of vertical offset. So when you get five and a half meters of vertical offset, you have moved the, the seafloor up close to 20 feet. It is, uh, you have a, what's essentially a big dome of water. It will, uh, it will seek equilibrium and, and generate a tsunami that propagates out in all directions and uh, most notably uh, straight in towards the coast in Japan. Here's a uh, simulation. I'm not sure how well you can see it, but it's along the Sendai coast. You can see a couple of things in this. Uh, one is that the, uh, the tsunami is a small amplitude offshore, and when it gets into shallow water, it slows down. And as it slows down, it increases in amplitude. And when it gets into the very shallow water where it starts breaking, the hydrodynamics become complex. Uh, the modelers don't uh, try to, uh, to sort of model that. Uh, chaos with this sort of uh, an approach. But the, uh, just wanted to point out that, that it's that permanent offset, not the oscillation in, in, in the wave that, that set, up the, uh, set up the tsunami. So we'll, we'll hear more about the damage in, in the next uh, talks and the, and the talks that follow. But I, I wanted to point out that uh, one of my Japanese colleagues described the, the Senriku coast in particular, the northern part of the uh, uh, area that was hit by a, the tsunami is, is perhaps the most tsunami-aware and tsunami-prepared uh, region on Earth. At the left is shown a, a print of uh, some uh, artwork that was done uh, after the 1896 Senriku uh, tsunami. Uh, what's shown on the, and it, you know, the scenes look uh, all too familiar, what's shown on the right along the Senriku coast are uh, run-up heights. So this is as, as high as the debris got in the tsunami for the 2011 uh, tsunami, shown in red, as well as past tsunamis in 1933 and, uh, and in this 1896 earthquake. So you can see, as bad as the, uh, as large as the tsunami uh, was uh, here, it, it had been, uh, uh, they've experienced large tsunamis uh, before. The difference in this case was the, the earthquake was so extensive along the trench that Places farther to the south, like the Sendai Plain and, and, and points south from there, uh, also experienced uh, gigantic tsunamis. And they, and they did not have this, uh, these unfortunate earlier experiences to, uh, to help um, prepare them for that. So I wanted to say a few words about why this uh, earthquake uh, defied expectations or was une unexpectedly uh, 
bad, and Hiro Kanamori uh, here, uh, an earthquake expert, an expert on large earthquakes in particular, is uh, quoted as saying, uh, I never thought this kind of event could happen. And of course, he, he means this kind of event in this part of Japan. And the question, the question we're all asking ourselves is, why didn't we think so, and could this have been anticipated? That uh, notion that this would not be a place for a magnitude 9 sized earthquake was based uh, primarily on the historical record. So the last 300 plus years of earthquake activity, there have been a, a lot of earthquakes in this region, many magnitude 7s, some magnitude 8s, uh, no magnitude 9. So we, there were large earthquakes, there were uh, highly damaging, uh, deadly earthquakes, but nothing like what happened in uh, March. And, and two, two earthquakes are, are particularly notable here, the 1933 and 1896 San Rico earthquakes. Both of those generated devastating uh, tsunamis. These other earthquakes, while big, uh, did not generate such, such big tsunamis. So people who study uh, earthquakes and try to, to understand the, uh, the, the, the likely size and, and uh, time recurrence of earthquakes uh, go through an exercise called segmentation, where they look at past earthquake history, such as this, and they try to define earthquakes, certain characteristic sizes of earthquakes. And, uh, and then, uh, based on the statistics of how often those earthquakes recur, uh, try, to, um, try to estimate earthquake probabilities. So this table at the bottom shows for these different uh, segments off the Japan, uh, the northeast uh, Japan coast, uh, it shows the size of the segment, the, the name of the segment, and the estimated magnitude in this column, and then the, uh, the probability of recurring within the next 30 years. This earthquake uh, that, that just happened uh, started in the, I guess it was the off-southern Sanriku uh, area here, so it was thought to have a very high probability of occurring, 80 to 90 percent. The adjacent segment, the Off-Miyagi uh, uh, section had a 99% chance of occurring, so almost certain to happen within the next 30 years. That's because it's been a while since the last earthquake, and uh, 37 years, the average repeat time is a large fraction of, uh, uh, well, 30 years is a large fraction of that. So this is based on, for, for that particular segment, the fact that there have been six earthquakes uh, on the average of every 37 years. Uh, and the, uh, there was a magnitude 7.2 earthquake that occurred in 2005. That uh, was uh, thought maybe to have uh, affected things, but since the magnitude was less than estimated, uh, they still had their eye on that uh, region, uh, that region being here. So they're expecting seven point, magnitude 7.5 to 8 sized earthquake there. Then uh, the four, what we now know is the foreshock occurred, right? That occurred on uh, March 9th. That was magnitude 7.3, again, a little bit smaller than had been uh, anticipated. But there was an opinion expressed that the occurrence of the probability of at least a magnitude 8 earthquake in that region might have been uh, lowered. And of course, you know, the magnitude 9 uh, earthquake happened. This, by the way, is adapted from a uh, preliminary report that uh, uh, Yoshi uh, Mitsu Okada, president of NEED, uh, prepared. Uh, he said, uh, uh, historically, it was known that there was a great earthquake associated with a huge tsunami in uh, 869 AD, the so-called Jogon earthquake. That was thought to be perhaps magnitude 8.4. It was not appreciated that it was magnitude 9. We don't even know if it, if it was, but, uh, but perhaps, it, uh, perhaps it could have been. So here I wanted to, to, to re-express the notion that a, that a magnitude 9 is really a, a, a much bigger earthquake than any of these uh, uh, put together or to put it succinctly, the, the whole is greater than the sum of a part, uh, sum of the parts. So this earthquake that happened on March 11th ruptured five different of these segments. It ruptured through all of them. Uh, their, their expected magnitudes are shown down here in this uh, table. Uh, those are the five uh, sections. We can do the sum of the parts. Uh, magnitude scale is logarithmic, so the addition is a little tricky looking. Uh, but trust me, um, if you add up all the large earthquakes in each of those sections, you get an earthquake that's magnitude 8.3. That's a, that's a large and dangerous earthquake, but it has uh, only one-tenth of the energy release, only one-tenth of the seafloor deformation, if you like, um, as a magnitude 9. So when a, when a large fault area breaks, another way of saying this is when a large fault area breaks, 
it breaks with a lot more total slip, average slip, than uh, small areas breaking individually. It's, a, it's an extreme event. So let me just uh, sort of wrap up with a, with a few points I'd like to make. One is that uh, accurate hazard characterization is an absolutely essential foundation for risk mitigation. If we don't properly bound the extreme events, what, uh, what could uh, possibly happen, uh, we, nasty surprises like this will uh, happen again, not just in Japan, but in other places. Uh, Rob McCaffrey has pointed out that there's 40,000 kilometers of uh, subduction zones worldwide. Most of them are sort of divided into segments based on recent earthquake history. Uh, we are suspicious now of segmentation uh, models, perhaps more than before. And uh, so there's, I think there'll, there'll be a reevaluation, uh, I think an, an increased look in the geologic record of uh, deeper time for the possibility that these extreme events uh, might have happened. Uh, on a, uh, a final note, this is the first great earthquake that has, dis that has uh, struck a developed country with modern infra infrastructure at an absolutely cutting rate, earthquake science, earthquake engineering. Uh, and there's a lot that will be learned uh, from this to improve the resilience of California and, and other places as well. Uh, we know that the Cascadia subduction zone, which stretches from Northern California to Southern Cascadia, could and has had events like this uh, in the past. Uh, earthquake monitoring in Japan is the envy of the world. Uh, they have uh, more extensive monitoring uh, equipment than we do in almost every measure. They have about a five or six times as many earthquakes as we do too. So the, the rate at which information is coming out of the earth is a factor of 10 or more higher in Japan than elsewhere. And uh, this earthquake in particular is going to be extremely uh, valuable for earthquake science and engineering because the Japanese were prepared with uh, so much in the way of uh, instrumentation. With that, I'd like to uh, uh, stop my talk and uh, turn it over to Greg Deerline, who will talk about engineering issues. You know, thank you, Greg and Pam, and uh, everybody here in the audience tonight. Uh, I had the opportunity about a week ago to travel to Japan to see some of the, the effects on structures and the infrastructure. And I'll be sharing some of that with you together with uh, information I've collected from friends in Japan, uh, things on the internet, and so forth. Um, when you look at the, the devastation from the earthquake, it's huge. The human casualty, the, the number of missing and dead, up, upwards of 27,000. Um, a huge number of displaced people. We still have 154,000 people in government shelters, probably a much larger number uh, with family in other parts of Japan. Uh, large financial losses, two to three hundred billion dollars, depending on which estimate, and the rebuilding cost even larger. And many indirect losses. When you look at the numbers of lost buildings, those are houses, places of work, manufacturing, and so forth, the impacts on transportation. Utilities, uh, it's projected that they've lost 11 percent of the generating capacity in Japan. Um, the uncertainty in the nuclear power plant. And then the effect on the many things that, that make the economy work, manufacturing, agriculture, the fisheries, particularly up on this coastal region. So, so the devastation is huge in, in the field I'm from, engineering. It's how we kind of engineer our structures, uh, the infrastructure, to, to mitigate these sort of risks, um, understanding, as, as Greg Barroza pointed out, what those hazards we face. Um, when you hear about a magnitude 9 earthquake and you go looking for the effect on buildings, the most remarkable thing was the relatively little damage there was to structures from the ground shaking. This was evident if you go to downtown, downtown Sendai. We were there a month after the earthquake. Services were back, but buildings were relatively intact. Um, so we begin to think, what's happening with the ground motions is the first question. As Greg mentioned, there's a very extensive seismic network, so we had many, many ground motions that we can look at. Shown on the right there is one of these uh, so-called KNET stations that dot the landscape every few kilometers, uh, recording strong motions. Um, the big thing about a big earthquake is with a large energy release is a very long duration. And you see, uh, this is an accelerogram shown in red in the top plot there, and three minutes of very strong ground shaking. Um, and that's going to have uh, very important effects. As Greg pointed out, it lifts up the ocean floor, it caused the tsunami, but in terms of shaking, it's this very long duration of shaking. But it's also interesting to note that you can have smaller earthquakes, shown here as a magnitude 7.4 aftershock, or in fact a magnitude 7.4 earthquake that affected the uh, Sendai region, Miyagi-Oki, in 1978, that have comparable intensities, that is the, the uh, peak ground acceleration that the ground is shaking with. So 
while the, uh, the duration of these smaller earthquakes is nowhere near the large ones, sometimes the smaller earthquakes that might be nearby can have equally strong intensities. Uh, if we look closer at the, uh, these are response spectra, something we use to gauge the, the influence of the intensity coupled with the frequency content, plotting for those of you that are from the engineering world, uh, the period of vibration of our structures versus the vertical axis, the, uh, the effective lateral accelerations generated from these ground motions. Shown on the left are a number of collections from the various sites shown in the colored plots. Those dark black lines represent our design spectra for, and this is from Japan, for how they design their bridges. So, What's interesting to see is for, while this is a very large earthquake, very intense ground shaking, uh, many of the acceleration sites, when we look across the frequency range, are on, on the order of what we're factoring into design to keep structures safe um, and at the lower bound to keep them serviceable. Also, if you see on the right side, remember there was a large earthquake in Japan, the Kobe earthquake in 1995, um, the red and the light blue shown on the right are superimposed on the tracings from this current earthquake. Uh, so we see, in fact, that, again, uh, the 1995 was a magnitude 6.9. The difference there, that rupture came right up through the center of Kobe. So a very smaller magnitude, but very close earthquake. But you see the ground shaking not remarkably different. Um, nevertheless, there were damaged buildings. As engineers, these are ones we're always on the lookout for. A lot of existing reinforced concrete buildings built before the 1980s when building codes both in the U.S. and Japan changed. So you see a couple of examples of these in downtown Sendai, kind of classic what we call non-reinforced or, or lightly reinforced concrete, non-ductile concrete. Uh, we took these pictures here. I was careful, though, to also take pictures of down the street to point out that not every building in Sendai, in fact, very few, looked like this. So when you look down these streets, we had to hunt uh, uh, far and wide to find these heavily damaged buildings. So in fact, in many respects, uh, there's some success stories in this earthquake about the engineering of structures, uh, retrofitting of structures over the years. Uh, Tohoku University is located a little bit uh, in Sendai up on a hill. Uh, shown on the left is, in fact, their civil engineering building, which was heavily damaged in 1978. It was retrofitted at the time, and it was damaged again this time. You could see on the lower left how the columns as part of that shear wall were damaged. This building's probably going to be torn down. Uh, the building on the right is a building that was retrofitted after 1978. And in fact, this building with the steel bracing reinforcing the, the reinforced concrete building, these non-ductile concrete buildings, survived rather well the shaking. Uh, some interesting anomalies come up near one of the KNET stations that recorded a 2.7 peak ground acceleration. That's a horizontal acceleration equal to 2.7 times your weight. Uh, some inspections around the site showed remarkably little damage to many of the structures in that vicinity. Um, that's something that has many of us puzzled and will continue to uh, try to figure that one out. Part of that high frequency motion probably doesn't have the damaging effect that, that we sometimes think it might. Um, there's other kind of damage. Uh, Tokyo, you heard many reports of the shaking in tall buildings. In fact, the tall buildings responded how we expected. The shaking was relatively modest by our design standards. Uh, but in fact, there was some non-structural damage. This dramatic uh, picture from a concert hall in Kawasaki near Tokyo where the ground shaking was relatively modest, a room much like this one. Uh, fortunately, it was unoccupied at the time that the earthquake occurred. But we did not have to worry about just our structures, but the uh, non-structural non components, the hung ceilings, the equipment, and the like. Uh, other examples, this is a library up in Sendai. And so these are things as we engineer not only the structure, working with architects and mechanical engineers, worrying about these systems as well. Um, some of the significant structural damage actually happened on the Shikansen railway lines. And this is important for Japan because, of course, the, the rail is a vital link. And shown here in red is the Shikansen that runs from Tokyo up to Fukushima and on to Sendai and beyond. And in fact, this had pretty substantial damage on many of the viaducts. Some of it's in the mechanical equipment shown on top, some structural damage shown below. Uh, what I found remarkable that, that in spite of the, the kind of the devastation and chaos that the railroad was very quick to start repairing these things. And you could see that uh, just a few days after the earthquake, things had been inspected and there were uh, rapid repair techniques going on to bring the railways back online. Um, the Shikansen viaducts, many of them were built in the 1970s. They suffer from what you saw in some of those uh, collapsed buildings of this so-called non-ductile uh, reinforced concrete construction without adequate steel reinforcement. Uh, so these are some examples of the viaduct damage that occurred under the earthquake. Uh, and again, this went on for kilometers, so not an insignificant uh, feat to come and 
uh, identify the damage, inspect it, and devise repair schemes. Uh, but here again, if you look on the slide on the left, is looking at uh, March 14th, the state of the damage, and by uh, April 2nd, uh, some repairs had been done. These are hasty repairs done, uh, temporary repairs. They're going to come back later and do a more thorough repair. Um, an interesting thing, there was an aftershock on April 7th. Uh, again, smaller earthquake, still big by historical standards, small compared to the magnitude 9, but relatively high intensity. And you see that the intensity is comparable uh, comparing the blue accelerogram to the red one from the magnitude 9 earthquake. Uh, and in fact, this damaged some of the repairs that had just been done. So it's kind of on, on the, at least these Shinkansen lines, I'm seeing kind of a constant uh, uh, fix and repair. Although they are uh, in Japan, as we do in the US, looking at some of the older structures, the challenge is to retrofit them in place so, they could, so that they'll survive the next earthquake. And there were examples shown here where they used some steel jacketing on columns. And these tended to perform pretty well. Uh, but again, you jacket the steel column, and you see the example on the right where some of the beams linking the steel columns got damaged. Uh, so we're always learning, but it also it's a matter of uh, balancing our resources in terms of figuring out what's the most vulnerable parts, in this case of the Shinkansen lines, where to devote resources to do repairs. Another of the big effects that came out of the earthquake was uh, ground deformations and liquefaction. I think the, uh, the long duration motion in particular, that three seconds of shaking builds up pore water pressure and it tends to liquefy, basically turning um, some of the regions, and in particular around Tokyo Bay here, which was quite far from the uh, strong shaking, uh, in, to liquefy the soil, causing this settlement. Um, traditionally, these have been sort of port areas, industrial areas, but increasingly, for instance, around Tokyo, they're turning into residential areas. So there was quite a bit of heavy damage to newly populated residential areas. And shown on the right, you get an example of how the Tokyo Bay has been kind of filled in over the last uh, six or 700 years in various degrees. Uh, so these are just a few slides of this so-called ground deformation and liquefaction. Uh, on the one hand, it's, it's inconveniences to uh, sidewalks that are, that are put out of kilter, uh, but there's also pipes and sewers. You see an example, dramatic example in the lower left of a sewer pipe that has come up due to this ground deformation. Um, so there's, there's in particular a few parts of those uh, um, kind of man-made islands, if you will, that have pretty high-end residential that have no sewer systems, have no water systems, it'll be some time before they're put back into service. And also you see some of the damage that occurs due to settlement, due to houses, either the ground around it or settlement of the structures themselves. Another place we often see ground deformations and liquefaction, again, these kind of coastal and bay margins would be in industrial plants. Uh, this particular slide here is showing some damage that occurred to uh, a thermal power plant, electric power generation fossil fuel plant uh, and in fact, one of the stories from Japan, we hear all about the nuclear power, the incidents there, but in fact, many of their fossil fuel generating stations were knocked offline, which compounds the problem with the electric utilities. And similarly, there's other industrial types of facilities that suffer this sort of damage along the coast due to this ground deformation. Uh, ports are another area that tend to be very susceptible to that. Um, and again, this is, uh, if you think about ports both for import and export of manufactured goods, also some of the fishing areas, um, also industrial facilities like this water treatment plant that's shown in the lower left. So these are things that, that get damaged and often require a fair bit of time to come back online, and there could be por uh, portions of communities and so forth without fresh water for quite a while after the earthquake. I'd like to switch over to the tsunami, which th the big disaster here really is the tsunami. Um, inundation waves from three up to a high of 39 meters. Uh, Greg Rosa described the, the general mechanism of the tsunami. The run-up in specific areas depends a lot of, on the, underground, or the underwater terrain and how it channels water in to different cities and regions. Uh, I think it's uh, remarkable Japan has an offshore warning system of buoys that in fact uh, electronically give forewarning when the tsunami hits. Folks there on their cell phones, television, radios quickly get these, these alerts and are, as Greg pointed out, very aware of the tsunami risk. And in fact, the picture on the lower right shows that uh, in towns that have had tsunamis, it's not uncommon to find markings of some of the historic tsunamis. So people are well aware of it, but we're worried about what's the inundation, what are going to be the flow velocities and the effect on structures. This is a picture showing uh, uh, Arama. This is kind of coastal Sendai. Uh, one of the areas that had an inundation here, I think it was, uh, might have been eight or nine meters. Um, you see the wave coming in, and in the lower right, you see the devastation to that coastal beach community. And one of the important things for tsunamis is 
You can see we don't design uh, low-rise residential structures for it. Really, you need to evacuate people. And the question is, can you evacuate people in time from these low-lying coastal communities, getting them far enough inland to get out of harm's way? Um, one of the, there's a few remarkable stories. One of them is shown circled in red there. That's a school building that was built in the midst of this coastal community. And when we went out to survey, in fact, that school building was one that had been seismically retrofit, but also was a designated tsunami uh, refuge site. And you could see where the inundation got up to the second floor, but when you went to the third and fourth floors of that, that in fact served uh, as, a, as a vertical evacuation for the school children and folks around from the community. And you could see for some times afterwards, in fact, they were still using it as a, um, kind of some for emergency shelter. But you could see around that school just the devastation that any wood or light frame housing was totally swept away. Uh, we also saw on the TV pictures of the Sendai Airport that was located a close distance to this here. And again, that's show, showing us that generally our, our large engineered structures can tend to survive the tsunami inundation fairly well, even though we're, it's not always intentional in their design. We design them to resist earthquakes, uh, but oftentimes if they uh, don't attract too much tsunami force, say if they have breakaway walls or so, that they can survive the tsunami inundation. And so, in fact, the, the Sendai Airport had been reopened just about a month after the, uh, the earthquake. A lot of the repairs were really dealing with more of the mechanical systems than structural systems in the building. Uh, but there's other examples where things are, don't work out so well. The uh, Onagata, this is a small uh, well, fishing town, one for fish processing with the port that you see there that had very large 18 to 20 meter inundation. Uh, coupled with subsidence uh, of the ground in the town. Uh, and this is a town that, that when you go into it, you see examples of automobiles on tops of cars. So, so the inundation went over three and four story buildings up to the heights of five story buildings. There's a large cliff here shown on the left, even up over on the top of that. Uh, when you look at some of the historical records for the city, there's reports of the inundation, tsunami inundation from the 1960 Chile earthquake. So again, there's, depending on the bathymetry, that is the underwater terrain, as tsunami waves come in, even remote ones are going to tend to, the cities that are, are uh, most at hazard, most at risk, are going to tend to have historical evidence of that because they tend to channel, for whatever reason, the, the water into the city. Uh, one of the things we found in, the, in that city that was uh, of particular interest was a number of overturned buildings. These were buildings, uh, three and four story buildings that had been totally uh, submerged. And due to the combination of both buoyancy effects, trapped air, coupled with the tsunami inundation, these actually tipped over. Um, and this is important because while we typically don't design buildings necessarily to survive the tsunami uh, to protect the building itself, that when we do think about vertical evacuation structures, that is tsunami refuge, we need to understand better um, how the effects of the tsunami wave are going to impact the structure. Um, but of course, that story has to start with having some good information on what the tsunami inundation height is going to be to start with. Uh, another town we visited, uh, uh, Rikusen, Takata, was another town that was just totally inundated by tsunami wave. I think it, and again, these towns are ones they know they have a tsunami risk. I mean, one of the techniques that's used for tsunami, kind of a modest level of uh, protection, is to put densely forested regions to slow down the tsunami wave, not to prevent the inundation, but to slow down the wave, slow down the flow, to then protect the structures, uh, allowing people more time and access to evacuation. Uh, but many of those, those uh, defenses were defeated, again, in this town here. What was remarkable here, again, very high tsunami inundation with a river nearby. The, 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 when we were driving down from the mountains to this town, it was just amazing how far inland we were, seven or eight kilometers, and still seeing uh, the tsunami inundation that just followed that river up. Um, so again, when you think of problems like evacuation and awareness, just to recognize it's not just being directly on the coast where you're at risk. Uh, a lot of bridge damage throughout, not only in this town, but many of the towns. This is one example that you see here, relatively modern concrete bridges, seismically designed well, oftentimes with isolators, but not always designed for the, the inundation and the uplift effect that these tsunamis have. Now, the important thing here is that bridges, and here's another example of one that was washed away. These become important. Of course, they're in place before the tsunami, so they're, they're there for evacuation. But then post-tsunami, when it comes to uh, 
emergency response and then reconstruction of areas. When bridges like the major bridges like this are lost, it has a major impact then on the recovery of these areas. Um, in that town, in spite of the fact that the bridges I just shown washed away, remarkably a number of buildings survived. This is an example of an apartment building that was virtually uh, right on the beach, half a kilometer from the beach. You see where the inundation height went up to, uh, flowed through the building, the building survived. There were a couple other examples of buildings. The one on the lower left was totally submerged. The one on the right, a, a, uh, interestingly, a kind of a marine exhibit that was right on the coast that survived. So, so this gives us some hope that as we look at ways to protect people's lives from tsunamis, short of evacuation out of the area is the best thing to do. But again, when you're too, when the coast is, the coastal plain is too large and there's not the time to evacuate, I don't think we mentioned yet, you know, the folks in Japan probably had about 20 minutes or so from the time they got a warning to the time they had to evacuate. Seems like a lot of time, but if you need to pick someone up at daycare, um, and, and again, you saw pictures on the news of some of the congestion of highways and so forth. Um, many of these areas, it's not possible with the density of people that are in them to evacuate. Uh, as Greg Barroza mentioned, that Japan is well aware of this tsunami risk, and there's a lot of safety and awareness. You see some of the placards here for evacuation routes, for vertical evacuation, for evacuation planning routes, even in some of these small towns. Um, there's often markers that show where Greg talked about those previous tsunamis. There's markers in various buildings and on hillsides to show where those tsunamis got up to. So there's a lot of awareness about what the hazards are. Um, and also there's been some dramatic attempts at, at mitigating or defending against these hazards. This is an example of this town, uh, uh, Kamashi Breakwater. That's apparently a 30-year-old project just completed in 2009, a massive undertaking that was really intended to defend the city against inundation waves. Well, it was just overcome by this nine-meter inundation that comes in, and you see the, the breakwater that's shown on the right. Um, so I think while we, the answer has to be we, we have to evaluate what the hazards are, what the inundation height, and then figure ways to engineer around it. But we need to be uh, kind of mindful of the, the kind of the limits of our knowledge. And coupled with that is what's the implications if we're wrong. And the last implication I'll give is the Fukushima Daiichi plant, the nuclear power plant, where of course had tsunami protection, but it just wasn't tall enough. And I think this is an interesting area because it really, as an engineer, we're always balancing working, trying to do the best science, in this case working with earth scientists to get predictions of ground shaking, tsunami inundation height. That's the hazard, but then weighing the risk relative to the consequences. So, so trying to balance doing the best science, but then also thinking about the what ifs. What if we're wrong? What haven't we thought of? And that's where the engineering of these gets tricky. Uh, the last point I wanted to mention on this, which I made earlier, is it's not just this one Daiichi plant, or in fact another nuclear power plant that's offline, as are a number of fossil fuel plants. I think one of the, from talking to friends in Japan, one of the concerns is coming into the summer months where the country is down on 11% of its generating capacity, and as the summer months come and needs for electricity and air conditioning and subways, crowded subways and so forth increases, that's gonna be a, a tenuous time to get through. So finally, I have just a couple of slides to, to wrap up with some remarks. Um, first thing, as I pointed out, buildings, bridges, other facilities generally performed well under the strong ground shaking. I think so, so, so in that sense, there is some success stories here. There's, of course, some of the examples I showed, non-structural components, continuing concerns with existing deficient structures, some critical transportation links that we have to be mindful of and continue to work on. Um, but in general, we're making progress there. Uh, we saw the widespread effects of ground deformation and liquefaction due to long duration ground motions. Again, this is something that's not particularly new to, to geotechnical engineers, but, it, but again, it's a reminder of the, the kind of disruption this can cause to various communities and to uh, utility services and the like. But then it was really the story about this disaster is really the tsunami inundation that caused uh, over 90% of the deaths to the people. Um, so I want to end there just to think a to little bit about tsunami risk mitigation and what are the takeaways from this. I think as we, as in Japan, as they look forward, as we look at risks in the U.S. and elsewhere, we need to think about land use planning to, to minimize the at-risk population. It sounds good in concept, but everybody loves to live on the beach, so in practice it's harder to do. We know that down on the Gulf Coast in the U.S. 
Um, approve effectiveness of evacuation, recognizing that, again, unlike hurricanes, there's not a long lead time here. There's very short response time. Awareness, early warning, evacuation ramps, uh, routes, and planning uh, for that evacuation are things we continually need to work on. I think we could do a lot more work on looking at buildings and other structures for vertical evacuation, uh, tsunami refuge, but we have to be very mindful of that, that it's kind of a binary problem. You need to be above the tsunami inundation. If you design for a, a 10 meter uh, and the tsunami is 15 meter, your evacuation structure is absolutely no good. In fact, it's, it's um, uh, beyond tragic reckless. So we, we need to think careful about how we design vertical evacuation structures. Similarly, tsunami defense structures, such as the breakwaters we show, we can't say it's not possible, but we have to just be kind of mindful to engineer those carefully, uh, make sure we're putting uh, the best science at predicting the inundation and the engineering into those breakwaters. And then finally, I think when we look at some of these tsunami-ravaged areas, uh, we need to be thinking that tsunamis are going to happen. They are going to cause devastation. At best, we get all the people out of harm's way. But there's going to be a lot of houses, a lot of businesses that are lost. But then we need to be thinking about community resilience. We could maybe harden bridges and critical infrastructure that can help communities quickly recover after one of these large events. Uh, but we need to be realistic about the risk and the, the trade-offs in land use, that if we're going to use that land that's on the coast, these beautiful areas, and build on it, we have to be prepared for the consequences. And, and if we get people out of harm's way and if we're prepared to rebuild, well, that's one strategy. And finally, the last point I'd like to make is implications for other at-risk countries from tsunamis. Uh, here on the Pacific West Coast, we have that. There's also tsunami risks uh, down in Puerto Rico in the Gulf. Um, and many other countries, one, er one area that uh, students here at Stanford have been looking at um, is some of the uh, risk in Indonesia. There's a city of Padang with a million people that sits, has a very similar tsunami risk to what we saw in Japan and what was seen in 2004 over in Indonesia that has a million people sitting in a very low coastal plain. And the question, how, how will those folks respond? Um, I think when we look at Japan, one of the the fortunate things, while the, while the death toll is devastating, is when you look at a city of Sendai of a million people, most of the population was fairly inland. There was these small coastal communities. There were other small uh, coastal towns uh, I showed some of the pictures of. And, and while those were tragic, things could be much more so when we look around the world at large population centers that face the same sort of tsunami risk. So thank you for your attention. Thank you to the organizers, thank you to my other speakers, and thank you to everybody for being here. Um, I've been asked to talk about the nuclear accident, specifically the one at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Um, I see we have some experts in the audience, but with apologies to them, I'm going to try to stick to just the basics. So here's an outline of my talk. Um, first, I'm going to start very basic. What is nuclear power? And I think it's important to have some basic understanding of that in order to understand what happened at Fukushima. Um, the situation is still ongoing, so I'll talk about what's happening now, um, and then touch on, I think, the question at the back of everybody's mind, could it happen here? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what this means for the future of nuclear energy, and how does this compare to previous accidents, like Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. But as I was putting this talk together, I realized how much ground we have to cover, so I'm going to leave a lot of that to the question and answer period, if people are interested. So, what is nuclear power? Nuclear power relies on the principle of nuclear fission, using neutrons to split massive nuclei in two. Um, this reaction produces two lighter elements called fission products, more neutrons and energy. Um, the released neutrons can go on to fission other heavy nuclei, and this is the famous nuclear chain reaction you might have heard of. Um, the fission products are highly radioactive. Um, it's important to note that the fissile isotope of uranium, the, the isotope that you can actually do, with it, do this with, occurs in very small quantities in nature. Um, the process of increasing this concentration of this isotope, uranium-235, is called enrichment. Nuclear power requires very low levels of enrichment, about 3 to 4 percent. Nuclear weapons, on the other hand, require about 80 to 90 percent enrichment. And so while there were explosions at the nuclear plant, and I'll talk about them later on in the talk, they weren't nuclear explosions in the sense that we think about them. 
the fuel inside a nuclear reactor can't directly be taken out and used to build a bomb. So I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind. Um, now, in the course of operation, the energy released by these nuclear reactions generates heat, which is then used to generate steam to drive a turbine. Now, because of this heat, the vessel containing the fuel rods has to be cooled continuously with a steady stream of cold water. Now, under normal operation, this water doesn't come into contact with anything radioactive, so it's not returning radioactivity into the ocean as it circulates through. How do we turn off a nuclear reactor if we need to? So the reactor can be turned off by deploying neutron absorbing rods called control rods, which absorb the neutrons and effectively shut off the chain reaction. But because those fission products are highly radioactive, they continue to generate heat even after the chain reaction has been shut off. And this decay heat is a very important concept. This decay heat is largely responsible for the disaster at Fukushima nuclear plant. So this means that the reactor vessel must be cooled even after the chain reaction is stopped, even after the reactor has, in essence, been shut down. So when this nuclear fuel has been used up, what remains? It's the famous problem of nuclear waste or spent fuel. So the spent fuel consists mostly of uranium that either wasn't enriched or wasn't fissioned, about 95%. Now, it's possible for the 238 isotope of uranium, the most commonly abundant one, to capture a neutron and form plutonium or other heavy elements. So that's this here. Now, the rest of the spent fuel consists of these fission products, the results of a nuclear fission. Some of these are highly, highly radioactive and have very short half-lives, meaning they decay very, very, very quickly. And some are less radioactive but are longer lived. So the composition of the spent fuel changes over time as these radioactive elements decay. Now again, because of this decay heat, the spent fuel has to be kept continuously cooled. And this is usually done by storing them in a pool of spent water, or a pool of cold water on site called the spent fuel pool. So what happened at Fukushima? Um, as far as I can tell, the actual structural integrity of the buildings wasn't compromised by either the earthquake or the tsunami. It seems to have withstood the impact fairly well. Moreover, the control rods deployed correctly, so the chain reaction was shut off. But the earthquake and the tsunami knocked out the power grid, and the tsunami washed away the backup power supply. So what this meant is that the AC power to circulate the cooling water through this system failed. And this meant that there were problems in reactor cores at reactors one, two, and three here, and problems in the spent fuel pools at reactors one, two, three, and four. So what do I mean by problems in the reactor cores at reactors one, two, and three? This is another way of asking what can happen when there's no way to pump cooling water into the reactor core? What can happen when this process fails? So what can happen? Normally the fuel rods are covered with a protective coating called cladding. When this gets too hot, it can react with air and release hydrogen gas. Now if too much of this gas accumulates inside the reactor buildings, it can cause an explosion. If the cladding itself ruptures, it exposes the fuel underneath. And when it exposes that fuel, it can release radioactive gas out into the atmosphere. The next step is everybody's greatest fear, meltdown, where the nuclear fuel itself starts to melt. And in that process, releases even more radioactivity into the environment. Now, the worst case scenario would be a total core meltdown plus a failure of all of the containment to keep that radioactivity in to keep it away from the environment. So that's what can happen if this uh, backup cooling mechanism fails. What did happen? We're pretty sure that the reactor buildings did explode due to accumulation of hydrogen gas. And again, I wanna make that clear that while that was an explosion at a nuclear plant, it was not, an expl it was not a nuclear explosion. Um, radioactivity has been detected outside the plant, and this indicates that the cladding has likely ruptured. It's not clear yet to what extent the fuel has melted, if at all. 
Um, but from the levels of radiation that we've observed outside the plant, I think it's very unlikely that this worst case scenario of total core meltdown and containment failure has come to pass. All of this, I want to note, is very speculative because we don't have access to the core right now. I mentioned that there's problems in the spent fuels at reactors one, two, three, and four. What does that mean? Well, when there's no water to cool the pools, similar effects, what I just described, can happen. But this problem is compounded by the fact that in this particular reactor design employed in Japan, the spent fuel pool is stored in the same building as the reactor core. So when the building was compromised, that removed the only barrier between the spent fuel pool and the environment. So I've talked about the release of radioactivity into the environment. What's being released? Now, most of the focus has been on two isotopes, uranium, or sorry, iodine and cesium. I'm going to start by talking about iodine. So the radioactive element of iodine, radioactive isotype, isotope of iodine, 131, is extremely radioactive, and it has a half-life of eight days. So what that means is after eight days, half of it will be gone, decayed away. After another eight days, half of that remaining stuff will be gone, and so on, and so on, and so on. So because of this rapid decay time, it means it's not present in significant doses in the cooled spent fuel. So that means that if we observe it, we can be pretty sure that something is getting out of the reactor, cure, reactor core. Why is, why is this bad for you? Well, I'm not a doctor, so take what I say with a grain of salt, but I understand that the body absorbs iodine through the, through the thyroid gland, and if radioactive iodine is ingested, even in very small amounts, it will get concentrated there and potentially lead to thyroid cancer. So this is why the authorities are recommending that those in the affected area, not here in California, those in the affected area, take potassium iodine, which prevents this accumulation. Cesium-137 and strontium-90, on the other hand, are comparatively long-lived fission products. They have half-lives of 30 and 29 years, respectively. So that means that these elements, once they're emitted from the reactor, will stay around in significant concentrations for about a human lifetime. Cesium seems to accumulate mostly in soft tissue, while strontium accumulates in bone and marrow. But the relatively long lifetime of these isotopes mean that they do pose a long-term problem. So what happens now? Well, in the near term, the most important thing is to bring the reactors back down to cold shutdown. Um, what that means is the temperature they would be at had this not happened. So as of now, they're about twice as hot as they should be, and the process of bringing them back down to cold shutdown could take months. So to stop the radiation leakage completely, both the core and spent fuel ponds will have to be recontained. And finally, the contaminated structures, the buildings themselves, and the topsoil will have to be dealt with. And this operation is going to be enormously expensive, enormously costly, and take many, many years. And in all of these processes, the limiting step will be the dosage of radiation that workers can be safely exposed to. So one obvious question is, could it happen here? California, after all, has two nuclear power plants located on the coastline. This here is Diablo Canyon near San Luis Obispo. There's another one called San Onofre near San Diego. Um, the short answer to can it happen here is probably not. These reactors are differently designed than the models at Fukushima, and they have more redundant and better backup systems to operate the cooling mechanism, even if the electricity is knocked out. And I'm told by colleagues that earthquakes and tsunamis of the exact type and magnitude experienced in Japan are relatively unlikely in California. But I do think the long answer is yes, and I'll explain why. It's possible to categorize the accident at Fukushima as a natural disaster, but in many ways it's a story about what happens when the power goes out. U.S. nuclear plants are required to include this contingency in their plans, and the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has taken the possibility of hydrogen gas buildup very, very seriously. But the major lesson from Fukushima may be that it's impossible to design away the possibility of every accident. Now, in closing, I want to put this event into perspective. Japan is still facing a devastating humanitarian crisis as a result of the earthquake and tsunami, and I find it 
unfortunate that much of the media coverage has focused on the nuclear accident. And this is certainly not to minimize the magnitude of what has happened at Fukushima, but to say that we shouldn't let our cultural obsession with frightening nuclear things distract us from the sheer scale of the tragedy in Japan. So with that, I'll end. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of our speakers. Um, we have some uh, 20 minutes or so for questions and answers, and I think one of our speakers at least set us up for some questions that we can ask. If you have any uh, to ask, or uh, there's a microphone on each side of the room, and you're welcome to come up and ask them. Okay, so the, the question is, uh, suppose, it's a hypothetical one, uh, suppose there's a magnitude 7.2 off the coast of Cascadia, similar sort of subduction zone, uh, to the one that hosted this uh, the March 11th earthquake. Uh, what should be the response? Should we evacuate the, the coast or perhaps uh, particularly uh, tsunami-prone peninsulas? Uh, it's a good question. I th uh, Cascadia has, has not had much in the way of uh, earthquake activity uh, uh, recently. I think if there were a magnitude 7.2 earthquake, it would be viewed with great alarm, even if it did not generate uh, any tsunami. Uh, earthquakes tend to cluster in space and time, uh, as, as uh, you know. So I, I think it, uh, it would be smart uh, to uh, take some of the steps that you uh, mentioned. Whether there are plans to do that or not, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I know that uh, earthquake scientists in this country are, are working towards quantifying time-dependent uh, earthquake forecasting, that is uh, getting right to that question, suppose there's a magnitude 7.2 earthquake, what can we say now is different than, than what, what uh, about earthquake probabilities than a, uh, uh, before the earthquake happened? I think Ross Stein, one of the speakers uh, tomorrow night, may have more to say about that tomorrow. There's a question up here. <clears throat> By the way, if you can't use the microphones, then the speakers will have to repeat your questions so that everybody gets them. Yeah, so, so, so the question was, well, the observation, as I showed some damage to these pre-1980s so-called non-ductile concrete, and what damage do we observe to other types of construction, steel braced frames or other types? And in general, what, what we saw was that in the older construction that had deficiencies, kind of the earthquake kind of picks out the weak players, if you will. So, so there was some uh, wood frame housing that had heavy damage, but again, that was kind of older, you call it more dilapidated. Um, very few examples of, of steel frame uh, damage that we saw. And, uh, and again, I think that's just a matter of that, the, you know, the earthquake shaking kind of picks out some of the weakest structures. Uh, up in Sendai, I think it's interesting that, that in fact, that since the city was shaken in 1978, and they've had a couple uh, earthquakes since then, um, they've had some retrofit programs in place, you know, so, so the earthquakes over time have naturally picked out some of the, the more suspect buildings, so there's been kind of a natural evolution, if you will. Um, but, but again, we were pretty surprised at the, the relatively low number of, uh, of damaged structures. Uh, yes, sir. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most of the subduction zone um, in California is actually inland, isn't it? as opposed to what's happening in Japan where it seems like the subduction zone is out in the open ocean. Uh, does that change the um, probabilities of a tsunami actually happening off the coast of California, say, compared to uh, what happened in Japan? Right, so, so in, in California, for, for in most of California, uh, the plate boundary is, uh, is what we call a transform plate boundary. So the San Andreas Fault, the major element of that boundary, uh, is uh, accommodating horizontal relative plate motion, not the kind of convergence you get in subduction zones like, uh, uh, like in Japan. That changes once you get up to Cape Mendocino. So uh, up near the Oregon border, it becomes very much like uh, the, the uh, subduction zone in, in Japan. And so there we, we, we expect, we think there was uh, a magnitude nine earthquake that occurred up there from, from there up towards Canada in 1700 based on, uh, largely on uh, tsunami evidence from Japan, uh, where the tsunami was um, recorded. So was there a big tsunami uh, off the uh, Pacific Northwest uh, in at January, that time, in the in 18th January, century? In January okay. 1700, So yes. we wouldn't expect really to see much of a tsunami uh, effect uh, 
here in, uh, in coastal California. We would expect it to see it primarily in uh, the Pacific Northwest. Right, the, the really big tsunami. However, there are uh, faults offshore, uh, particularly in Southern California, where because of the configuration of the plate boundary, there is a component of convergence. Okay. And those have the potential for, not for magnitude nine earthquakes, but for perhaps high sevens. Also, I note that the, uh, most of the really heavily urbanized areas in Cali California actually are sort of uh, inland from uh, the uh, mountain chain. You know, like this, like the, um, uh, uh, what is it, the mountain, uh, the mountain chain that's uh, uh, you know, along the San Andreas, would that uh, provide sort of a, a, a sort of a natural breakwater for, the, for a tsunami? Uh, you mean the coast ranges? Right, the coast range, right. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, so we got, we have a free, we, we sort of have a free, yeah. uh, free gift from nature. You know, uh, uh, yeah, al although, I mean, there, there are tsunami inundation zones uh, uh, with, uh, that are mapped along the California coast, and, and, and there, there is a lot okay. of development along the coast that is potentially And that's been mapped out, I guess, uh, pretty well. Mm -hmm. right. yeah, let's go to this side. Hi. Um, a question for Kate. The um, failure of the electricity after the acts after the tsunami, I mean, the core was really hot. Couldn't there just be a passive circulation system that could kick in and take advantage of that heat and use gravity? What a great question. I think you should work for the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. <laughs> um, that, that's an excellent question, and that's actually the question that has been asked many, many times. And so you're starting to see that sort of thing incorporated into the design basis of a lot of nuclear plants. Is it currently in, in operational in plants or in is the being US, yes. in the US? Yes. Is. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir. Uh, could you comment on the importance of culture on population response? Okay, so you're talking about the evacuation and, and uh, post earthquake well, uh, response? I, I didn't hear anything about uh, uh, looting, for instance, which would have great impact on the uh, ability of law enforcement to be directed in other directions. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, just, and, and I don't, I mean, most of what I have would be kind of anecdotal. One, having traveled in Japan quite a bit and often feeling safer there than I might in other cities in different countries. Um, and, and clearly, I, um, so there's kind of more unity of spirit, I think, amongst the, the Japanese people. Um, so I'm not aware of any kind of unruliness after these, these terrible tragedies. Um, I do also think, though, that sometimes those things, when they happen in other countries, such as ours, might get overstated by the, by the press. I'm not sure that they're that the stories of looting are as widespread and dramatic as sometimes they're made out to be. But that's just my opinion. And I, by the way, I think tomorrow night's, uh, two of the speakers tomorrow night will be speaking about the sort of response of society and of, of uh, government and corporations and so on. So maybe we'll have more of that discussion tomorrow night. Yes. Um, some tsunamis are caused by uh, pieces of mountains falling into the water. Wasn't there one great thing that wiped out the Minoan culture? And my question is, uh, the bottom third or so, southern third of the big island of Hawaii has a big crack across it. Uh, someday that's going to fall off. <laughs> what Has anybody analyzed how big a tsunami that might cause? Yeah, so th there are two questions there. One, one was about the Minoan civilization, I, and I think you're referring to Santorini, which was a, a volcano that erupted a long time ago uh, and uh, <laughs> generated a, a, a large tsunami that, that, that devastated the eastern Mediterranean. No, no question about that. Um, I, I don't know enough about uh, history to know the, exactly the role in the demise of the Minoans. Um, the other question was about uh, a big crack in Hawaii and, uh, and a, a possible landslide uh, event that would generate a big tsunami and how, how big the tsunami for that might be. Uh, there is evidence in the seafloor off the coast of the Hawaiian Islands for truly gigantic landslides that, uh, that generate tsunamis that are incomprehensibly high. Uh, they happen uh, uh, order 100,000 years apart. So there's called sector collapse of, of, of the volcanic flanks of the island. 
Uh, the, the crack you're referring to is, is the, I, I think, is the rift zone, uh, the southwest and the southeast rift zone of Kilauea Volcano. Those are active. There, there's magma welling up in those uh, every few years. I, I think it's not quite the same thing, but there, there is the potential uh, for these large uh, volcanic uh, island uh, flank collapses that would generate gigantic tsunamis. Over here. Uh, I'm kind of interested in the, the either stress buildup or relief in the California faults due to the Japan earthquake. Is there any, can, any comment on that? The, the, the question is the whether the there's is, a change in the, earthquake. The, the, the plate tectonics, as we all know, uh, can... Uh, you know, the, the earthquake happened in Japan. Mm -hmm. What is the effect of the uh, faults here? I mean, effect of Japanese earthquake on the stress or relief of the faults here? Right. So the, any the, comment the, on it? Yeah, sure. Uh, the, the stress change in California from the earthquake Japan, as large as that earthquake was, the, uh, the, the stress change is not, uh, is not measurable. It, uh, as far as I know, has not had a, an effect on the, the rate of earthquake activity in California. Uh, there is a sort of interesting phenomena where uh, tiny little earthquakes and, and uh, related phenomena are triggered at great distance from big earthquakes uh, like this. There was a little bit of that that happened in California, but we haven't seen a change in earthquake rates. Uh, the, the, big, the big story for the change in earthquake rates for uh, the time being is, 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 is will be with Japan. Uh, and there's a, th this is a, an earthquake sequence, and we're partway through it. So Ross Stein is going to talk about that again tomorrow night. Yeah, so th th yeah, I mean, earthquakes are happening all the time. Uh, there, there have been various stories in the press about earthquakes proceeding uh, counterclockwise around the Pacific plate, or clockwise, I guess it is, uh, Chile, New Zealand. Uh, Japan, and then the, the, the notion is that we're somehow next. Uh, that, that's based on three earthquakes, just enough to define such a trend. <laughs> there, there are, and during that period, there are 17 magnitude 7 earthquakes around the Pacific Rim here and there. Um, it's just, you know, it doesn't, if you scrutinize, you look at the data uh, with a critical eye, that there's nothing to that. Okay, question here. Uh, Professor Deerline, do you think there are any serious shortcomings in the way structural engineers are designing buildings here in California today? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, just, just, just what are the most important ones, maybe? And, uh, and then how do you think this earthquake will change our, our design practices here in the future? Hmm. Yeah. Well, I, th I think that um, one of the things we've always stressed in, in uh, earthquake structural engineering is to make buildings safe against collapse. And we've you know, over the past hundred years, we've done better at that. Today, with computer models, we can make make assessments of the risk of collapse better and better. I think there's a growing awareness that we need to look at higher performance for buildings. Uh, you know, in other words, uh, a code-conforming building, a building that meets code when it goes through a large earthquake, may be uninhabitable, may need to be demolished after the earthquake, or it may need major repairs. So, so I think if there's kind of a shortcoming um, that we as a kind of community have. It's, it's perhaps um, you know, just that. We're not looking at that higher performance level, and perhaps the uh, public at large, the owners and so forth, aren't fully aware of that. And, and so it, you know, partly the, the practice in building codes have evolved over time to, again, make buildings safer, but not necessarily to, to ensure there's kind of continued occupancy. Um, in terms of whether this earthquake in particular would change practice in the US, I, I don't see it right now, uh, you know, because as I showed, we didn't see really any surprises in terms of how buildings responded. I think we are going to find there's many, many instrumented buildings. Um, Japan uses a lot of seismic isolation. They use advanced damper systems in some of their buildings, which we don't make as much use of in, in the US. And I think this earthquake will provide some important data on how well those systems work and perhaps some more visibility on those. So in that sense, it might come forward. but. Uh, but I think the big thing is really going to be looking at, you know, as I've mentioned, the effect of tsunamis, at least in so far as those areas that are at risk from tsunamis, thinking not just about our structures, but communities at large. Okay. Here. Uh, to what degree do you think that the lessons learned from this will actually be learned? Any potential lessons to be learned will be learned, and do you think that this means uh, that there? Uh, what do you think this means as far as the uh, 
future of nuclear power in California? Um, so in answer to your first question, um, I think it's still early days to even know what lessons we should be learning from this disaster. Um, we don't have access to the core, we don't have access to the spent fuel pools, and so we're not 100% clear exactly what's happening. Um, we can start to draw certain lessons from it though. Um, we know that it's very important, as the other questioner asked, um, to design strategies for what happens under conditions of station blackout. That's a lesson that we can take away from this. We can take away what happens when hydrogen gas starts to accumulate. How do we prevent that explosion? So there are certain sort of high level lessons we can start learning. And I do think that there has been a lot of attention paid to this and um, there are reviews going on. Um, with regard to your second question, I think um, what this means for the future of nuclear energy in California, that's kind of a two-part question. One is, what will it mean? And one is, what should it mean? Um, do we need nuclear energy? What do we want? Do we want to cut emissions? Do we want to have cheap energy? Do we want to not have to institute efficiency measures? And the answers to that, those questions, I think, will be paramount in the long term in deciding what our energy future in California will be. Okay, we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, I heard that there are three plates colliding each other around the coast of Japan, and now the big one hit. And is there any possibility that moves to move uh, to west side, which is most people afraid of for a long time, is area? That's one question. And if that if that doesn't happen, how long will it take to settle the or the aftershock? Is that months, years, and that can that's another question. Two last questions. Uh, the, the first of them, I, I think you were referring to, so in, in Japan, in uh, eastern or northern Japan, it's the Pacific Plate subducting underneath uh, 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 northern Japan, and there's another plate, it's a, it's a younger, warmer, slower moving plate, the Philippine Sea Plate subducting. Both subduction zones have a history of now of uh, large uh, earthquakes. The, this earthquake that happened on March 11th was so big that it, it, it changed the stress uh, appreciably on uh, you know, most, of, uh, most parts of Japan. Uh, one of the speakers tomorrow night, I keep referring to uh, Ross Stein, he's sitting right behind you. He, he's going he's gonna to quantify this for you, but, but, but the, uh, the, uh, the bottom line is that, that things have changed in, in Japan, that the, the, the stresses have changed. And that's going to change, uh, we, you know, by all we understand about earthquakes or think we understand, that's going to change uh, the occurrence of, of future earthquakes. Uh, there was another part to your question, which was, how long is this going to last? Uh, decades? Years, for sure. Okay, well, thank you. I want to say before we close the, this evening that um, this, uh, tonight's, uh, Presentations will be on uh, Stanford YouTube in a couple of weeks, available if you want to see it again. If you can't come tomorrow night, but you're very interested now, and after hearing a little bits about what tomorrow night speakers are going to be saying, um, I guess that that's available through streaming uh, webcast. Uh, and the site is uh, on, the on the posters. Okay. So um, what we do hope you come back tomorrow night. I think it'll be a very interesting continuation of the discussion we've had tonight. And so as we end, let me thank all of the speakers. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.